First thing I want to do is start off by saying thanks for having me. And, and it means a lot that you would have me here today to talk about Charlie Murphy, the iconoclastic showman behind the Chicago Cubs. And one of the things that excites me most about being here is the opportunity to share with you a little bit about someone from the dead ball era who is not particularly well known. And I think there are a couple of reasons for that we can dive into a little bit later. But the goal for tonight is to give you a sort of an overview of his life and his career in order to emphasize his importance to the success of the dead ball era Cubs. And I think one of the main factors in that is I tried to research the opinions and viewpoints of those who operated within his circle to draw upon their expertise rather than just to offer my own thoughts on his life and career to almost in a way justify his importance and success to the ball club. And I think in addition to his life and career, the book is about a couple of other things. Number one, it's about the Irish immigrant experience. And that in particular relates to the, the great famine in the, the mid 19th century. It also relates to the developing relationship between organized baseball as well as the White House. And Teddy Roosevelt, not a fan of baseball, but obviously as, as you all are well aware, President Taft was a huge fan of baseball and Charlie Murphy and President Taft had a pretty close personal relationship that I'll talk about in, in a few minutes. Uh, also, the book is about the business of baseball from 1890 through 1914, which is basically the last decade of the 20th century through the conflict that organized baseball had with the Federal League. And 1914 is the year where Murphy was actually forced to sell the team. So that's kind of the cutoff point there in terms of Murphy's career in baseball. But when we look at the business of baseball, it changed in quite a few ways in the 1890s, as well as uh, the first decade of the 20th century. So, the, yes, the book's about Murphy and his life, but it's also about these other things as well. Um, before diving into uh, Murphy uh, himself, I, just a little bit of why I even came up with this topic or where I even found him. Um, the first person or the first a person people ask me about uh, when I tell them that I, oh, I'm writing about Charlie Murphy. Say, oh, I love the Chappelle show, which of course I do too. Who doesn't love Chappelle show? It is a different Charlie Murphy. And what's so interesting about it is I, I came across him and through, uh, through kind of a backdoor channel. Uh, in 2016, the Cubs obviously win the pennant. And uh, a friend of mine sent me a text message that was telling me, hey, did you know there's a guy from our hometown who through the, the World Series uh, winning, clinching pitch in 1908, 108 years ago. And I, I didn't know who or Orville Overall was at the time. And so started to do a little bit of research on Overall, who was from Central California, and did a piece on him for nine. But in doing that piece, I came across his friendship with Frank Chance. And Frank Chance is from Fresno, which is right in the heart of the San Joaquin Valley in Central California. And Overall and Chance played against each other as teenagers. They knew each other very well. Um, Chance went on to sign with Chicago and overall went to Cal Berkeley, where he was a, a college football and baseball star. And that's where they parted ways. But in researching their professional careers, they consistently had contract disputes with this guy named Charlie Murphy. And so that's how I first came across him. And I thought, well, Murphy's obviously in trying to negotiate uh, tough tactics with chance and overall and things like that, kind of a standard practice at the time. But the more I thought about it, I took a step back and I just, I looked at the numbers and he owned the team for eight full seasons, Murphy did. And the Cubs during that span had 801 wins, four pennants and two World Series titles. And my takeaway, just by looking at those numbers, I thought, this guy must be doing something right. And I'm curious what it is. And so that's how I got started in diving deep into Murphy. And the number one thing I wanted to learn was who he was as a person, because there were myths and rumors and things like that about Murphy and Murphy the goat and the Cubs and cursing and, and not winning and all this type of stuff. But what I wanted to do was look at who Charlie Murphy was. No myths, no rumors, no stereotypes. I wanted to know in what ways he was successful 
and in what ways he failed. Uh, in other words, I wanted to know who he was as a human being. And so that's essentially where the project got started. And the first article that I came across that really struck a chord with me was Hugh Fullerton, the Hall of Fame baseball writer, um, penned an obituary about Murphy after he passed away. And they knew each other. Uh, they grew up about 20 miles apart in Ohio. Murphy grew up in Wilmington, Ohio, and 20 miles away, uh, Fullerton grew up in Hillsboro, Ohio. And so I thought I would read just a, a little bit of that obituary to you from the introduction of the book. And I think it gives us a little bit of insight into Murphy's importance, or at least the central role that he played in the National League at the time. So Fullerton writes, Murphy is dead. The jolly, turbulent little Irishman from Wilmington who came out of Cincinnati to start more trouble and make more baseball news than any man in the history of the game finally lost out in his battle for health and the end came after years of suffering. Charles Webb Murphy, son of Patrick and Bridget Murphy, was for half a dozen years the central figure of Major League Baseball and the most hated and upsetting figure in the game. He goes on to say, Murphy was a showman, a baseball fanatic, a quick thinking, quicker acting fellow whose fiery, impulsive temperament kept the entire baseball world bubbling. And so after reading that, I thought, OK, there's something here and you don't have to take my word for it or writers at the you know, it, if Fullerton says it, there's something there because Fullerton knew so many people throughout the sport. And so I was drawn to that. The other aspect as I got into the study of Murphy's life is not a lot of people in the game of baseball knew him personally. They didn't know his tortured childhood and Fullerton did. And so Fullerton had in a lot of ways more grace and an understanding uh, towards Murphy that others didn't. Now, Murphy didn't go out of his way to try to build alliances uh, in the boardroom, uh, for sure. But Fullerton had a grace towards Murphy that he didn't. And so that's why I started out with Fullerton in the introduction. And it leads really to the beginning of Charlie's story, which is the difficult crossing that both of his parents had from Ireland to America in the mid 19th century. Uh, Patrick Murphy was Charlie's father and he immigrated to America from County Cork. His mother, Bridget O'Donnell, followed a few years later from County Tipperary. And there were a group of Irish uh, that actually, they bypassed the East Coast and they moved to Ohio. In fact, Ohio is maybe not top five, but just outside the top five in the 1880 uh, census numbers for uh, the number of uh, foreign born Americans living in the country. And so he's in Ohio, uh, Patrick is. He's living in Cincinnati. And the crossing was very difficult. There was typhus, uh, poor treatment at the hands of the crew, icebergs, uh, malnutrition, a number of things that affected the crossing. And so it's uncertain exactly what year or how old Patrick was when he crossed. It's impossible to know if for no other reason than the sheer number of Patrick Murphy's that came over. But we do know that he's 14 years old, living in Cincinnati. And it, it is about this time where he starts to cultivate a trade. Uh, he cultivates this trade in the 18, uh, late 1850s uh, as a plasterer. And he decides to open his own business. And so he moves uh, 50 miles to the Northeast to a little enclave, Wilmington. And Wilmington is home to a burgeoning Catholic population. And it's also growing by leaps and bounds at the edges. And the city wants to construct a local college. They're interested in building a railroad. Uh, government buildings are also in the works. And so it's really a great place for Patrick to develop this plastering business about town, which he does. In the meantime, a few years later, Bridget O'Donnell crosses and she too, along with her mother, wind up in the Wilmington, Ohio area. But there's a little bit of uh, tragedy, to say the least, for Patrick uh, in between the time that Charlie's parents meet. And it started when Patrick's co-worker, his partner, his best friend, 
uh, Webster Ferguson is injured in a work accident. And as a result of that, there are unconfirmed reports, but the playing out of his life certainly seems to indicate that he suffered from pretty severe uh, brain damage. And as a result, he is unable to function uh, in society and he's uh, institutionalized. And so not only does Patrick lose his friend to this horrific situation, but also his, his partner in his business as well. Uh, simultaneously, Patrick marries a, a gal, Ellen Murphy, or Ellen Murray, I should say, who obviously becomes Ellen Murphy. And uh, just a few months later, Ellen passes away in childbirth. Uh, the baby survives, and it's unclear exactly what happened to William Murphy. We lose track of him when he's about five years old. But by the time Patrick and Bridget meet and get married in 1866, they've already experienced a lot. And they're young kids, uh, early 20s. And so when Charlie is born on January 22nd, 1868, he's given the middle name Webb, and his father gave him the middle name of his best friend. Um, uh, but there's a lot of issues in the family already. And so um, Charlie grows up in a home that is um, difficult in certain ways. His father um, is arrested a number of times, um, jailed. There's uh, physical abuse, threats towards the wife and the children uh, in, in which he ends up in, in jail. And it's during these early years that Charlie said he developed the ability to apply salve uh, almost a balm to a wound verbally. And so when his father would try to manipulate him or in the case of taking his paychecks away from him, when Charlie had to go to work as a 15 year old at a local drugstore to buy food for his mother and his three younger siblings, father would try to take that paycheck and Charlie would find a way to talk him out of it uh, and allow him to keep that money. And it would be frustrating for Patrick who wanted it. So you have this dynamic where Charlie grows up in an environment at home where he has to, in essence, uh, manipulate his dad to provide for the family for them to survive. So it's a challenging childhood in that sense. In the meantime, though, they play a ton of baseball and his brothers joined Charlie out on the local fields. They had a younger sister, Katie, who was so much younger that she wasn't uh, playing baseball with them per se, but the three boys play baseball a lot and Charlie loves it. He studies the game. He finds a way to support the local college team uh, financially, if you can believe that as a youngster, but Hugh Fullerton talks about that. And he just loved the game. And so that was an important part of his childhood and also in a sense of Americanizing himself and becoming saturated in the popular culture of the day. And so you have this dynamic in Wilmington as it plays out where the family is really not able to sustain itself. And so Charlie says, I've got to, I've got to leave Wilmington, figure out what's next for me, but in a way to figure out what my family can do. And so at that point, he decides to move to Cincinnati. And it's in Cincinnati where he arrives about 1889, 1890. And at that point, he's 20, 22. And he's a drug clerk still, as he started out in uh, Wilmington. But he meets a ton of people in a local neighborhood. He works in the drugstore. A lot of people come in for prescriptions. He gets to know them. And, and he befriends a number of journalists. And Charlie's a great storyteller. There's a great story about how he wanted to go to see the Reds on opening day. And he tells his boss, hey, I've got this meeting with this client across town. I got to go. And instead, Charlie goes to watch the Reds play on opening day. He hustles after the game back to the drugstore. And his boss was like, well, how did the meeting go? And he, you know, he tells him, well, you know, the guy didn't want to buy anything after all, a bunch of nonsense. And his boss just nodded, uh-huh, uh-huh. And then at the end, when Charlie's done talking, his boss looks at him and says, well, the customers that just came into the store told me you were the loudest one at the ballpark and everyone could hear you throughout the entire grandstand. So you're fired. So Charlie has a lot of stories like that where he's full of energy, full of passion for the game, but also at times it gets him in a little bit of trouble. But it's a wonderful match, Charlie Murphy and journalism. And as he befriends the journalist, they tell him, hey, you're a great storyteller. Why don't you try writing for local newspapers? And so he ends up getting a job with the Cincinnati Inquirer. So in one of the really fascinating twists of Murphy's story is that in 1892, in the city of Cincinnati, you have three really key players uh, 
uh, in town at the same time. You have Murphy, who's writing for the Inquirer, just a brand new journalist. You have Ben Johnson, who at the time was writing for the Cincinnati Commercial Gazette. And then Charlie Comiskey was hired to be the player manager of the Reds in 1892 by John T. Brush. And so Murphy, Johnson, and Comiskey as babies are all interacting in Cincinnati in 1892. And that really plays a key role in later years when Murphy and Johnson were constantly in conflict with one another when Johnson was the president of the American League and Murphy owned the Cubs. And Murphy didn't like Johnson from the jump. They didn't care for each other very much at all. And Comiskey was kind of in the middle. He was obviously playing still. He wasn't a writer. But Comiskey developed a pretty good friendship with Ben Johnson. He also became friends with Murphy as well. And so that stayed uh, a similar dynamic throughout their life where Murphy and Johnson clashed, but Comiskey could kind of broker the peace between the two to a certain degree. And that played out in later years in the business of baseball uh, a few decades later. So one of the interesting things about Murphy's coverage as a journalist was he thought that covering the games during the season was incredibly important, but he also elevated off-season coverage. He did not want to concede, or he did not want baseball to concede off-season headlines to college football. And so as a result, he would do his best to dig up in those days what he called baseball dope. Uh, off-season rumors, and then he would publish articles about them. And those articles became very popular. And he got to know front office people throughout the game as a result, and also fellow writers. And it was part of his strategy to make baseball a 12-month-a-year uh, business, essentially, for his newspaper anyway, there at the Inquirer. And his coverage became more and more popular about town. And uh, to give you an example of what he would do, one year, he went to the winter meeting at the Fifth Avenue Hotel in New York. And at the time, the president of the National League was Nick Young. And the owners were in their boardroom having their meeting. And Murphy and a host of other writers were down in the bar waiting for them to finish so that they could talk to them about the goings-ons of the, of the conference that they had just held. And the meeting went on and on and on. So finally, Murphy said, let's get together in the bar. So they, you know, the ones that were already there stayed, they pulled the other writers in, and Murphy says, okay, here's what we're going to do. We're going to declare the pennant winner. We're going to revise the Constitution. We're going to approve of these new bylaws. And then we're going to go home and write about it. We'll just make it up if they're not going to tell us. And so they're all kind of cracking up. And then Murphy goes, let's, let's go talk to them and see if they'll give us the real dirt. And so Murphy leads a parade of writers up to the boardroom and he pounds on the door and someone kind of cracks open the door and looks out and Murphy hollers in the crack door to Nick Young. Hey, you guys are done. You need to come let us in and let's talk. We need we need to go home and tell our bosses that the the uh, meal money they've been spending is worth it, that we're going to get some information out of you guys. And so President Young stops the meeting and says, all right, you guys come in and you can talk to the owners for a, a, a spell, interview them and then be on your way. And it was it's kind of a, a, a fun story that exemplifies Murphy's desire to pursue that offseason uh, coverage. At the same time, when he did that, one of the owners in that room who I mentioned earlier, John T. Brush, he took notice of what Murphy was doing. And John T. Brush, this guy is a grouch and he's difficult to get along with. And he's a tough, tough guy. But Murphy really abused him, cracked him up. He got a big kick out of Murphy. And so it planted the seed for Brush in a few years when Brush sells the Reds and buys the Giants. Brush thinks to himself, Murphy would be a great guy to take with me. And so that seed is planted at that winter meeting. And sure enough, that's what he does a few years later. Um, the aspect of that that I think is really interesting is that the teams, particularly Brush, started to notice that as organizations, we can promote ourselves by helping the writers. And so Brush didn't want to do that. But when he acquires the Giants and moves to New York, he tells Murphy, if you come with me, you can be an ambassador for the club. 
give writers inside information, not too inside, but just enough to keep them satisfied and writing about us and promoting us on the road. It will not only increase our, our brand, brand awareness is kind of what we would call it today, but also in theory, the gates go up, the crowds go up. And this is coming from Brush who had owned a clothing store in Indianapolis. And, and so he was familiar with marketing. So the one thing Brush and Murphy really did have in common was this uh, passion for marketing, the ability to do it, kind of a knack. But before Murphy and Brush get together in 1905, something really instrumental happens for Murphy. And that is Charles Taft and his father-in-law buy two newspapers in Cincinnati and they combine them and they create the Cincinnati Times Star. And Charles Taft is the oldest son of Alfonso Taft. And his, his mother sadly passed away. Alfonso Taft, though, is a political player. He's a lawyer and a political player, not just in Ohio, but in D.C. as well. And Charles Taft grows up in this burgeoning uh, political powerhouse of a family, the Tafts. And they really acquire a large chunk of money when Charles Taft marries his wife, Anna Sinton. And Anna Sinton's father, David, uh, Charles and David went in on their newspaper, but David Sinton was really uh, very wealthy. He had been a pig iron magnet during the Civil War and just crushed it. And he uh, gave to his daughter a fortune of $20 million. And that, in a lot of ways, is the seed money for uh, the, Taft's, the Taft family's political aspirations in a national sense, was that $20 million fortune. And so Charles and Anna are, are looking for ways to spend money in the city, which they do. They're very philanthropic. But he, Charles and his father-in-law buy this newspaper, The Times Star. And one of the things Charles wants to do is hire the best writers in town. And he knows Charlie Murphy is very popular. And so Taft hires Murphy to write for The Times Star. And it's at that point that Murphy develops a personal friendship with not just Charles, but his wife, Annie. They had a, love, a shared love for the theater, performing arts. And the lifelong friendship between Murphy and the Taft family is established. Shortly thereafter, Brush buys the Giants and Brush calls Murphy, says, hey, let's go. And Murphy agrees to go and become the first press agent in the history of the game, 1905 in New York. So he says goodbye to Charles Taft. It's an opportunity he can't pass up. And he moves to New York. And so in just a span of, you know, 12 years, he's moved from Wilmington to New York City. But that's nothing compared to the accelerated rate at which his career is about to take off. Early 1905, he's in New York working for the Giants and the writers in New York can't stand him. Who's this, you know, country bumpkin from the West who's trying to tell us how to do our jobs. And Charlie just keeps, you know, cranking out PR releases essentially but no one wants to pay much attention to him. So Charlie decides he's going to go out on the road and promote the team in the visiting cities. And he goes to Chicago a few months into the 1905 season where he meets up with Jim Hart, who's a friend of his. Jim Hart's the president of the, of the Cubs. And he's sitting in the bleachers one day with Hart and they're just chit-chatting. And then Murphy asks Hart about the state of the Cubs, about the state of the organization. And Hart says something that shocks Murphy. Hart says, I think the team is going to go up for sale. And Murphy says, what? And sure enough, John Walsh, who was the primary shareholder of the Cubs at that time, he was uh, a banker and he was on the verge of legal trouble because he was using uh, liquidity from his banks to finance some personal expenditures that were not doing well. And so Walsh was in this tangled mess of debt and potential investigations. And so he needed to come up with some cash very quickly. And his decision was the best way to do that is to sell the Cubs. And so Hart's telling Murphy this, and Murphy is just stunned to hear. And Murphy says, well, how much are they going to cost? Now, Murphy knew that Brush had sold the Reds recently for $150,000 before buying the Giants. So when Hart tells him $100,000, Murphy can't believe it. He says, you've got to be kidding me. And so he tells Hart, well, I can't afford that, but I know someone who can. Will you give me a, a, a small window to come up with the cash 
and we can do the deal. And Hart says, yeah, I'll give you a small window to, to make this happen. And Murphy says, great. And he sprints to the train station and he jumps on the first locomotive headed to Cincinnati and he bounds into Charles Taft's office and he says, boss, we got to make this deal. It's a deal of a lifetime. You won't believe this. We can get the Cubs for $100,000. And I've seen the young nucleus that that team has. This team, the sky's the limit for the Cubs. We're, we're going to not only make our money back, but we're going to do very well. This team's on the verge of great things. And Taft at first is a little suspicious, but then later, well, later, in a matter of a week or so, he sent someone up there to vet what Murphy was saying. He comes around and he says, okay, I'll do it. And he loans them a hundred grand. They buy the team. And in the course of six months, Murphy goes from writing for the, the Time Star to being the vice president of the Cubs midseason. Now it is Taft's money, but Murphy says, I will pay you back out of the profits that the club makes. And it was a stroke of genius because Murphy had the loan paid off in under 18 months. He knew the potential that the Cubs had. The one hiccup for the ball club itself was that in the middle of the 1905 season, their manager, Frank Seeley, took ill. And sadly, he was ill for essentially the rest of his life, although he had moments where he was better and could manage in the minor leagues a little bit. But essentially, he died very, very young as a result of this illness. So in the middle of the season, Seely has to step away. And there's a young 28-year-old uh, first baseman named Frank Chance, who's named the interim manager for the remainder of the season. And Murphy is the vice president of the club keeps harder, asks Jim Hart, his buddy who he talked to, please stay and show me the ropes. And Hart goes, no problem, happy to do that. And in the meantime, Murphy's observing Chance and watching the team respond to him. And so Chance is the interim manager for 88 games. The Cubs go 55 and 33. They finish in third place, but Murphy has seen enough. He says, this is gonna be my guy. And as the season comes to an end, Hart moves off into retirement, a little bit of a story there, but Hart moves off into retirement and Murphy says, I'm going to open negotiations with Chance. So this, they start negotiating on a, on a contract and Chance is interested in staying on as a full-time manager, but Murphy throws him um, a contractual option that Chance just can't turn down. And that is Murphy says, I want to offer you a multi multi-year deal. But as part of the multi-year deal, I want to offer you the option to buy a 10% stake of the ball club. Now, uh, I mean, I guess at one time, Billy Bean may have been offered a potential stake in the Red Sox. Someone much smarter than me is going to have to, you know, tell me yay or nay on that. But I, I've never even heard of a manager being offered a, a stake in the club. And sure enough, chance said, okay, I would love to do that. And throughout 1906, uh, $700 came out of his paycheck and uh, it's in Annie Taft's records where he paid 10 installments. Uh, I forget, I think it's 10 installments. He acquires 10% of the club over a period of, of the eight or nine months. And so he becomes a minority shareholder. Now, for those of you who know a ton more about the Cubs, even than I do, those shares eventually wound, wound up with Ackerland. And so just in terms of context, uh, later on, Chance sells his shares to Harry Ackerland, who was a minority owner in Pittsburgh. So anyway, you enter 1906, Chance is the manager, he's fully installed with a multi-year deal, and he's also well on his way to becoming uh, a shareholder in the ball club. And that was the smartest thing Murphy ever did, was hiring Frank Chance on a permanent basis and making him essentially a partner Murphy wanted to partner with Chance, didn't want to hire him, didn't want Chance working for him. He wanted to partner with him. And it was an incredibly successful partnership. One of the really course changing dynamic for Murphy as an outsider in the game of baseball happened in the off season uh, as well after the Chance contract was done. Chance had some ideas on how to improve the team for 1906. And he wanted to acquire a new third baseman and a backup catcher. And so he gave Murphy the names Harry Steinfeld and Pat Moran. Murphy goes out and acquires Steinfeld and Moran. And then on top of that, there was an outfielder, Jimmy Sheckert. And Jimmy Sheckert was 
kind of languishing in Brooklyn. He had been a good player. He was friends with McGraw. He wanted to go to New York. He wanted out of Brooklyn. But Murphy thought to himself, if he's if Shekhart's good enough for New York, and he had heard a rumor that Pittsburgh was also interested, he said, if he's good enough for New York and Pittsburgh, he's good enough for the Cubs, let's go get this guy. And Shekhart was at first a little reluctant, but then as soon as Murphy made the deal, Shekhart agreed to join the Cubs, uh, well aware at what they were building. And so these three trades for Steinfeld, Moran, and Shekhart take the Chicago Cubs from being a contender to a dominant ball club entering the 1906 season. Their lineup had no weaknesses. Their bench was strengthened. Their outfield defense was outstanding. And this really established Murphy in the eyes of chance. And so back to the book, there's a really interesting quote. I think that might be Uh, advantageous to read from Frank Chance to give you his perspective on what Murphy had done in his first full offseason as the Cubs president and owner. Chance said, I'll wager that there is no one in baseball any closer to his players than President Murphy of our team. There is not a man on the team who does not like him, and you will see this bunch pulling together this season as hard as any team ever did. Mr. Murphy, like most of us, like most of us, has youth and enthusiasm, and he knows how to treat his ball players. He is one of us. He takes an active interest in everything that affects the men in any way, and is always ready to give good advice and counsel when anything goes wrong. Many a manager has told the club president what he wanted to add strength to his team, but the chief executive didn't always get what the manager asked for. Some persons may doubt the wisdom of our deals, but I guess time will show that we knew what we were doing. And so the Shepherd trade really galvanized the Cubs in a way that even Chance didn't anticipate. And it earned Murphy Chance's respect as well as that of the entire clubhouse. So we move into the 1906 season and not to get too chronological and also from a time standpoint, uh, I don't want to get too bogged down into the games themselves. There's some of that in the book and and I'm sure you all are well aware of, of the Cubs and their seasons during this era. But in 1906, the Cubs with this reconfigured lineup win 116 games. They finished 116, 36 and three, and they finished 20 games ahead of the New York Giants. So uh, this is an unbelievable season, a record in terms of wins, but alas, in the World Series, they meet the hitless wonders, the 1906 Chicago White Sox. It's Comiskey and Murphy. So from 1892 in Cincinnati to 1906 here in Chicago, meeting in the World Series and Comiskey's White Sox upset the Cubs and win the World Series in a shocking upset that left Murphy and the Cubs players in disbelief. That said, Murphy and Comiskey had a great relationship, and Murphy congratulated Comiskey and held up a Sox banner at the ballpark and high-fived the White Sox fans, and he tried to be a good sport about losing the series, but it was a devastating loss for their organization, and it really set the tone for what was to come in the next couple of years. Um, As that's happening... William Howard Taft, he's climbing the political ladder. And in 1906, 1907, as the Cubs are moving away from 1906, that World Series loss, and into the 07, 08 era where they win back-to-back championships, William Howard Taft is the Secretary of War. And one of the things Murphy did is he sent Taft season passes to the West Side grounds every year. And he sent... In 1907, the passes to William Howard Taft, but at that time, it was becoming pretty common knowledge that President Roosevelt had tabbed William Howard Taft as his successor. Taft was not a particularly, uh, how shall we say, uh, he didn't love politics. He was not particularly excited about running for office. But he wanted to do it. He wanted to carry on uh, Roosevelt's 
agenda, although he was he proved to be more of a moderate in the end, which won him nothing but enemies on both sides and, and ended up with Roosevelt and the Bull Moose Party and losing to Wilson and all that. But at the time, Taft was on the rise as a secretary of war. And so Murphy writes Taft a letter that includes the passes and Taft writes him a letter back that I think exemplifies the, the nature of their, of their burgeoning friendship. Taft writes, thank you for your kind expressions. If the sentiment you refer to, as in ta uh, Taft's popularity growing, if the sentiment you refer to grows as fast as the prestige of the Chicago club under your management, it will certainly be formidable. And so that nice note from Taft, um, I think exemplifies that the two of them were increasing in terms of their, not just their national stature, but also in power as well. And so the Cubs enter the 07 season. Uh, Taft is on his way uh, in a year, year and a half, what, 08, November 08, to the presidency. But in 07, the Cubs, they again have another dominant season, 07. They're 107 and 45, 17 games clear of Pittsburgh, and they sweep the Detroit Tigers to win the World Series. And it's a wonderful moment for Murphy and for the club, and they feel very uh, justified in the moves that they made the previous year to acquire Moran, Steinfeld, and Sheckert. And it's a great moment in the city of Chicago. There are pictures, uh, I wish I could show you, but there are pictures of thousands of people in the streets uh, listening to the results of the game as they come over the wire. And the, the crowd is thrilled at the success that the Cubs have had. And then, of course, you have 1908, which, again, a lot of you are going to know quite a bit about the 1908 season. This one is much more tightly contested, obviously, than 06 or 07, uh, those pennants for the Cubs. But in 1908, the Cubs, the Pirates, and the Giants are locked in a three-way battle. And Fred Merkel's base running mistake late in the year forces a replay of a game between Chicago and New York at the Polo Grounds. Chicago wins the game. Mordecai Brown comes out of the bullpen and shuts down the Giants and the Cubs once again win the pennant. That story is relayed in the book. Someone asked me recently, what, Mur uh, what role did Murphy play in the 1908 season or in the Merkel game? And I think what's interesting about that is Murphy actually played very little, uh, a very little role in the Merkel game itself. But a few weeks before the Cubs were playing the Pirates, and a base runner for Pittsburgh, Warren Gill, had made the same mistake that Merkel was to make later. Warren Gill was uh, at first base. There's a base hit to win the game for Pittsburgh. Warren Gill does not touch second base. Johnny Evers notices this, tells umpire Hank O'Day, Gill didn't touch second base. O'Day says, get out of here. Uh, the run scores, the game's over. And Evers goes nuts, Chance goes nuts, and they go to Murphy and they say, we need to file a protest. So Murphy files a protest for that Pittsburgh-Chicago game with the National League board, and the commission takes a look at it. They don't do anything, but Harry Pulliam, the president of the National League, is well aware of this ruling. Murphy makes a huge deal about it, writes letters, very upset about it, and all that came into play when Fred Merkel doesn't touch second base, the Giants run doesn't count because Hank O'Day, the umpire in the Pittsburgh Chicago game, is umpiring that same day at the Polo Grounds. So he knows the rule. They just went through this and Merkel's out. And obviously with the pandemonium after the game, with the fans streaming onto the field and all the things that went into that, the games later replayed at the end of the year and the Cubs win. So Murphy had actually played a key role in protesting that previous game based on the same exact ruling that came up during the Merkel game, which I think is kind of interesting. Um, once again, 1908, the World Series features Chicago and the Tigers. This series is a little closer in terms of how the games are contested, but once again, the Cubs win and they repeat. Unfortunately for the fans in Chicago, they see a lot of tickets to the World Series games available through scalpers. And they're very upset by this. And so there's a large chunk of Cubs fans that protest and boycott the games. And Murphy is trying to figure out what's going on behind the scenes. But publicly in the newspapers, fans are complaining, writing letters to the editor that 
Murphy's responsible for allowing scalpers to get a hold of tickets instead of actual fans. And this becomes a PR crisis that takes away all the headlines from the games themselves. It leads to small crowds, which leads to a smaller payout for the players. And so on the field, while the Cubs won, I think one of the reasons why all these years later, Murphy's not well known, and maybe some of the details of the uh, this particular Cubs team are not as well known. Obviously, some of the players are, but some of the, the goings-ons of the games and the series themselves is because the ticket scandal just dwarfed anything that went on uh, on the field itself. And it damaged forever Murphy's reputation with the fans. Now, a couple caveats. The first is Charlie Williams, who worked in the front office along with Charlie Thomas, everyone's named Charlie, uh, for the Cubs, they said we had such a short turnaround that we had a problem with the printer. And so there were issues with the tickets, but it's more than just scalpers got all these tickets. And that's one aspect of the controversy that came out afterwards. The other thing that came out is there were so many complaints to the commission that they reprimanded Murphy, but didn't punish him. But one of the fallout uh, aspects of the scandal was that the National Commission said, we're going to take over the sale of World Series tickets from the teams. We'll do it. And so the next year, interestingly enough, 1909, you would have expected everything to go smoothly now that you have Murphy removed from the equation, right? Because the Cubs weren't in the world, <clears throat> excuse me, the World Series the next year. But they had the same problem. They had a huge ticket scandal in 1909. In fact, many Tigers fans said we didn't even get tickets. So you have the same problem the next year, even with uh, Murphy completely uninvolved in the process. So it was much more complicated in the end than simply the Cubs organization, you know, deviously allowing scalpers to get tickets and taking them away from the fans. But that led to a meeting in the off season after the 1908 season that changed the course of the organization forever. And that was a meeting between Frank chance and Charlie Murphy that absolutely exploded chance had signed an extension in late 1908, but the Cubs were in third place and didn't appear that they were going to go on to win the pennant and chance after the season was over, wanted to renegotiate that deal. Cause not only had they won the pennant, but they had gone on to win the world series. And so Chance went to Murphy's office one day in the offseason, and he said, I know we agreed to this deal, but I, I, I would be you know, remiss if I didn't try to renegotiate it based on the result of the year. And Murphy exploded and basically accused Chance of uh, being egotistical and taking too much credit for the team's success. In a lot of ways, Murphy was just frustrated because he had actually given Chance a blank check and told him, you tell me the amount you want to get paid, and that's what I'll pay you. And so Chance filled in his own checks, basically, on the new contract. So Murphy was mad about it. And yet that conflict between the two, even though peace was brokered later in the offseason and the two came back to work together again in 1909, it made Murphy suspicious of Chance's motivations and Chance, who had basically given up his entire body physically. I mean, he'd been hit in the head so many times with pitches. Uh, he just felt incredibly disrespected. Um, he said later, I would have been open to taking the deal I had agreed to, but the way Murphy responded to me uh, offended me to such a degree that I can't work with him anymore. And so even though they patch things up with an intermediary, a friend, a mutual friend, um, it was tenuous from there on out. And injuries, as well as that relationship, really tanked the 09 season. And the Pirates were so good that Chicago um, finished out of the money in 09. And then even though they won the pennant in 1910, at that point, they were a little bit older. And the Philadelphia Athletics were an outstanding club. And not only that, but the Athletics had scouted the Cubs a little bit during the season. And during that 1910 World Series, the Cubs, um, they got beat at their own game. The A's had stolen their signs and uh, they used that to their advantage throughout the series and, and beat the Cubs there in 1910. So you've got the four pennants in the five years and the two World Series titles at the end of that run. So just to wrap up, a couple of things in Murphy's post, um, basically post baseball days. How did it happen? 
Well, there's a couple of things that happened, but the tipping point came in 1914. Frank Chance left the Cubs organization and joined the New York Highlanders slash Yankees. And so Murphy had to decide between Joe Tinker and Johnny Evers, who are going to manage the club. And he selected Evers. And so Evers takes over and Charles Taft and Charlie Murphy did not like the way Evers managed the team. Uh, Taft thought he got ejected too much. And Murphy said, I'm paying you to play and I'm paying you to manage. So when you get thrown out, I don't have my manager and I also don't have my second baseman. So this year, you're, you're killing me twice, Johnny. And so it leads to a conflict between them and Murphy decides he's going to fire Evers. The problem was at that time, the federal league has emerged as a real competitor in Chicago as Charles Wiegman. He's flush with cash and he's building the ballpark on the North side and he's ready to establish a Chicago federal league team. And if Murphy fires Evers, which he decides to do, the other owners are aware that Evers could easily jump from the National League to the Federal League, and they cannot afford to lose one of their biggest stars. Now, in the end, something I write about in the book, plenty, but Tinker ended up going to the Federal League. That's a different story altogether. But um, as far as Evers goes, the other owner says, we've got to stop Murphy from doing this. So he, Murphy decides he's going to fire Evers, and yet he doesn't tell the most important person. He doesn't tell Johnny Evers. So he starts telling other people, hey, I fired Johnny Evers, but he doesn't tell Johnny. So the owners call Johnny into a meeting and say, hey, what's going on? And Evers says, I don't even really know. And so at the end of the meeting, the owners decide that Murphy has created chaos and they have to solve it. And the way that they solve it is they force Murphy to have a meeting with Charles Taft to address Murphy's entire uh, stake in the organization. And they tell Taft, he's creating a problem with us when a competitor can eat us alive and we can't afford it. That's one dynamic. The other dynamic is they engineer a trade of Evers from Chicago to Boston. And of course, Evers in 1914 goes on to, what well, he had one of the best years of his career. And I think he had 438 in the World Series. And he's the only one of the Hall of Fame Cubs to win that third ring. So Evers channeled that anger uh, into success in that season, but it wasn't in Chicago. Initially, Taft is really reluctant to force Murphy out. At that point, Taft's a minority shareholder as Murphy's repaid the loan. But Taft eventually uh, gives in and he calls Murphy and Murphy says, all right, well, I can see that I can't make anybody happy and I'll, I'll sell. And so he sells for $450,000. And so at that point, Murphy's out of the game 1914. Now, there's some wrinkles later on where Taft agreed to pay him over a period of time. And so technically, Murphy actually owned stock in a club for the foreseeable future, uh, and that created an issue or two down the road. But ultimately, Murphy's out of the game just before the 1914 season opens. And so from there, just in closing, Murphy turns to uh, his hometown of Wilmington. Charlie had always been a big fan of performing art, the performing arts and musical theater. And he spends $250,000. There's an unbelievable amount, 70 train cars of sand, four cars of lumber, half car of carpets, light fixtures, many from Europe. And he builds a performing arts center on Main Street in Wilmington. And he says to one of his friends, I don't want people to visit my grave in the local cemetery when I'm gone. I want them to see this theater on Main Street. And so that theater opened July 24th. 1918. And it still stands today. Uh, back in, in uh, July of 2018, the theater celebrated its 100th anniversary. And it truly is Murphy's Monument there in, in Wilmington. Um, uh, after the theater opens in 1918, he is impossible to track. Uh, he's out of the limelight, out of the news, doesn't talk a lot. Uh, rarely do people go find him. And I think that's part, he didn't have children. So his personal papers, personal photographs, I don't know where they went, but they've disappeared over the years. Um, but he, he reemerges in the fall of 1931. He's now 63 years old and very ill health. And he passes away in Chicago and it makes some news, but just uh, a matter of days later, Comiskey passes away. 
And that completely moves Murphy off the page as Comiskey's death takes center stage in, in the city of Chicago. So that's a lot to throw at you. I'm sorry the PowerPoint didn't work. But at the end of the day, I think a couple of, of takeaways for Murphy's career. The first is that, yes, Frank Seeley and Jim Hart and the Cubs organization had already acquired the young nucleus of Tinker Evers Chance, Mordecai Brown. Yes. And that, content, uh, that nucleus made them a contender. But I think Murphy and Chance partnered to make that roster a dominant roster. And I think that's an important thing to note. I think the other important thing to note is his desire to increase the baseball coverage early in his career as literacy rates were increasing throughout the country to cultivate more of a, a, a fandom, not just for the Cubs, but for the entire sport uh, in terms of the West region of the country. Now, in those days, obviously, Cincinnati, Chicago considered West, but he wanted to really grow the game in that part of the country as well. And then finally, his interest in the performing arts led to a theater in a small town that really served as the social hub of a community that embraced it for over a hundred years. And sadly, the, the pandemic really, really did a number on the theater and it had to close for a long period of time. And it's, it's just now getting back on its feet, but hopefully for years to come, people will enjoy the theater and, uh, you know, be able to, to come together to, uh, celebrate not just the performances, but also his contribution to the city as well. So that's the story of Charlie Murphy, the iconoclastic showman behind the Chicago Cubs. Uh, thanks, Ryan, for your time and be happy to answer any questions or talk about anything that uh, I may have uh, left out. Any questions? Anybody? No. All right. Well, I'll, I'll say, uh, I've got, I've, I've got oh, one here. Go I got one here. Um, hey, Steve. Okay, go ahead. Hey, Jason, just great job, man. I, Thank you. I consider myself a baseball historian. I didn't even know a thing about Charlie Murphy until your book came along. So <clears throat> great stuff. <clears throat> just one point about your, your question about, uh, uh offering Frank chance an, an ownership stake in the Cubs. And you're saying yeah. you'd never heard of that. I don't think that was terribly unusual at the time. I, okay. I know for a fact that John McGraw okay. took an ownership stake in the Giants when Charles Stoneham bought the team. And that was something that McGraw had wanted for a long time. Um, and I'm pretty sure that other managers during the period had some, well, Connie Mack, obviously, but I think there were other yeah. managers who did. Because I think here's the thing. The manager in those days wasn't just the field manager. The manager was the general manager too. The manager was managing the roster. The manager was negotiating trades. The manager was scouting and signing prospects, negotiating contracts. The manager was doing a lot of front office stuff that they don't do nowadays. And I think it was a it was a bigger job than it is now. Thank you. I appreciate that. That makes a ton of sense. And yeah, thank you for sharing that with me. I had left it in the in the in the book. I kind of just did the the who, what, when, where, why of it with Murphy and Chance not being totally sure about other orgs and their their setups. Um, but that makes a ton of sense. And I, 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 I appreciate you sharing that. And thank you for helping me with that. That's awesome. Yeah, it was like, uh, Robert, yeah, you get a question. Okay, thank you. Um, yeah, I have a question regarding your sources, though. You mentioned that um, Charlie Murphy's uh, papers are, are uh, uh, really unknown as to their whereabouts. So uh, what kind of sources did you use? Hall of Fame, sporting news, newspaper columns of, of the day? All the above. That's a, it's a great question. Thanks for asking it. It was a lot of newspapers.com. And uh, Charlie was more than happy to talk to any reporter who walked by his office. And so he's quoted extensively in newspapers, sporting life, but the, the game, uh, Wilmington had some archives as far as the theater goes and the Cincinnati history museum had all the Taft's archives. And so we, that's where we could kind of come up with the financial numbers, the big source, and actually I have it on my desk. The big source was at the hall of fame. And here's an example of, of it. Um, the Hall of Fame has the meeting minutes of all the winter meetings. So they had a stenographer sit in the back 
And so literally you they pull out this binder and it'd be this thick and it would say something to the effect of December 12th, 1908, Fifth Avenue Hotel, Waldorf Astoria Hotel, day one. And, and you could read it and you could just read the entire meeting. And um, I think I checked a bag that weighed about, you know, 80 pounds full of copies, but it was unbelievable because that's how I really got to know Charlie himself. And in fairness, it's also how I got to know Charlie Ebbets a little bit and George Dovey and Gary Herman and on and Harry Pulliam. Uh, there's a very sad part of the book that pained me to write, but Charlie Pulliam commits suicide. And um, I, I just, it was so hard to read, but are so hard to write. You just don't want to write about that, but it was so tragic. But in one of the sections of these meeting minutes, I found a whole conversation between all the owners at near the end of Harry's life where they're talking about, we know he's struggling. What do we do? And do we call a doctor? Do we have an intervention with a family member? And George Dovey, who, who owned Boston at the time says, I've struggled with abuse uh, with alcohol abuse in my life. And no one could have ever sat down and told me anything I didn't want to hear. And my only point with that is, wow, that's, that's amazing, uh, incredible stuff that the sonographer just sat in the back and typed. And it's all in those uh, Hall of Fame files in those meeting minutes. And so that source took the book from this might be a decent idea and maybe I can get something for nine or saber or a Chicago publication out of it to I, I now know enough to uh, write confidently about other topics as well as the interactions between these individuals. So I hope that answers your question but that that really was a game changer. Yeah, thank you. Um, just another one, one follow-up question, though. Um, sure, were sure. Were you able to get any uh, player contract information? Because I know the uh, Hall of Fame has uh, 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 player contract uh, files. Uh, there was, uh, there was available. I was just, I was just curious if um, Charlie Murphy happened to uh, spread the wealth, as we should say, with his players after he, uh, after the successes they have. It's a great question. So, Char yes, there were some contracts, not all, but some contracts. Charlie, <laughs> I said it. Well, I say at one point in the book, Charlie, if he's guilty of anything, it's because it's a, he was ahead of his time. If you were in your mid twenties, he paid you top dollar. The minute you hit 31, 32 and your numbers started to, you know, taper off a little bit, he wasn't going to pay you at the top of the market anymore, and he was happy to move you. And he knew analytics before analytics, in other words. Yeah, it's really interesting. He um, he would pay a top dollar uh, and did reward those guys. And 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 there's another quote I have in here of Chance uh, later on in the book before things really get testy and personal between them. Uh, and he talks about, hey, we're treated fairly. Uh, they're, we're very happy. And he's he's able to pay me, uh, Joe, Johnny uh and steinfeld and a few others now the two who were never really thrilled with their deals or orville overall was never really thrilled with his contract but overall's career was cut short by arm injuries so you know every situation is a little bit unique um but overall murphy was willing to pay uh until your numbers started to taper off and he thought there was a younger option that they could scout and sign and uh, someone who could replace you for cheaper. I think that's pretty standard, but um, anyway, yeah, hopefully that answers your question. Yeah. Thank you. Great, great work. I'm really, really looking forward to reading this. Appreciate it. Thank you. Okay. Anybody else? Anybody? Okay. So uh, let me just point out if anyone needs a copy of the book, uh, there's a link to get it for half price. Uh, Post it on their, our Facebook page and our Twitter page. But if you go to saberci.org, it'll take you to the link in the coupon code. You get the book for half price. And thanks to Jason for giving us that coupon code. Uh, quick question, Jason, what's the next project? Oh, the next uh, the next project I'm working on right now is uh, uh, Willie McCovey. And uh, there's a dual. I, I, I'm Right now, it's a potential dual work with Willie McCovey and Billy Williams, who are both born in 1938, about eight miles apart. 
They both debuted in the big leagues in 59. Uh, they went to the Hall of Fame a year apart, and they're both girl dads. They only have daughters. So the last <laughs> chapter is on the, their legacy as, as fathers. Um, we'll, we'll see how that pans out. But right now, a ton of progress on the McCovey side. Um, it, it's been a ton of fun to talk to the family and get to know them. But uh, two guys who played in the shadow of uh, superstars who deserve their uh, limelight for sure, but but two guys who deserve to be remembered for their accomplishments and, and who they were uh, in their own right as well. So that's what's next. Fantastic. Sounds great. All right. And one more thing for us is that this Saturday, we if you're going to be in central Illinois, we're going to be at the normal Corn Belters game. Uh, uh, Colonel's Collegiate League doubleheader, five o'clock first pitch, 430 gates open. We're meeting at four. We're going to get a stadium tour. And we're gonna have a guest speaker. So four o'clock in normal. Details are posted on the Facebook page, or you can message me. Feel free to do so. Thanks, everyone. Thanks for joining us. Thanks, Jason. It was wonderful. Hey, my pleasure. Thanks, everyone. Have a great have night. Everyone. Have a great night. Have a good one. Thank mm -hmm. you.